This presentation is about the clerk's own prologue. You will see a picture of him here. Here he is on his horse. However, first, go to schmoop.com and read about the clerk of Oxford. You will notice that he is number eight in the presentation in the general prologue, whereas the wife of Bath is only 15th. This says something about his status. So here we go, here's the prologue. Sir Clark of Oxford Town, our host said, you roy ride as coy and quiet as a maid, just newly wed and sitting on the board. Hmm, remember the host is Harry Bailey. We know that name already. From your tongue I haven't heard a word. Perhaps you're pondering reason and rhyme, but Solomon says each thing has his time. So Harry's telling him, come on, get on with it, it's your turn. For God's sake, be now of better cheer. What's he saying here? Cheer up, stop reading. The time for study is not now and here. Tell us some merry tale in God's name. For when a man has entered on a game, he needs must to the game itself assent. Which means you joined us so, and you agreed to play the game, so you it's your turn. But preach not, though, as friars do in Lent to make us for our past sins to weep, nor tell a tale that sends us all to sleep. So our host, Harry, is quite clear about what the others definitely don't want to hear. Tell us some merry thing of your adventures. Tell us something happy here. Your rhetoric, your flourishes, your figures. Keep them in store. In other words, put them away until you come to write in the high style as men to monarch's might. Harry is still talking. Speak out plainly at this time, we pray, so we can understand all that you say. So what are you saying is, speak up, so we can all hear you. The worthy clerk answered him benignly, Host, quoth he, you hold authority, for now you have of us the governance. You're in charge, so I will do as I'm told, and therefore will I show obedience. As far as reason goes, assuredly, I will tell you a tale from Italy I learned at Padua from a worthy clerk, as proved by both his words and his work. So what he's saying is he's learned a tale um, in Italy, so it's not an original story he's telling. He's dead now and nailed up in his chest. I pray to God to grant his spirit rest. Francis Petrarch, the laureate poet, this clerk was called, whose rhetoric sweet illuminated all Italy with poetry, as Lignano did in philosophy and law and other art particular. But death that will allow no lingering here, as it were in the twinkling of an eye, has slain them both as we shall all die. Hmm. What he's saying is both Francis Petrarch and Ligano have recently died. Petrarch actually died in 1374, um, a little while before Chaucer started writing this book. This is the clerk still speaking. But to tell briefly of the learned man that taught me this tale, as I began, I say that first his style climbs the heights. So what he's saying is he is so impressed by Petrarch's style. And then he gets a little carried away. Before the body of his tale he writes a preface in which described we see Piedmont and Saluzzo in that country and then the Apennines, hill scenery that sets the bounds to western Lombardy and Viso, especially the mountain where the Po from a little fountain springs and from which it takes its source that eastward flows swelling in its course to Emilia, Ferrara and Venice which would be a long thing to devise. And he's just realised now he's got to become practical again. And truly, in my own poor judgment, I think it is a thing irrelevant. So he's saying, OK, that's not really relevant, actually. Except to frame a setting for his matter. But here's his tale, as you shall now hear. 
So he's explaining that this is just the setting for the, his story, which is set in Italy.